Real Chemistry. I'm Dr. Morris, and today we're going to be talking about the harmonic oscillator. Specifically, we're going to talk about how the harmonic oscillator helps us understand how vibrating molecules relate to the light they've absorbed, or in some cases, emitted. So what's the harmonic oscillator? Well, it's a model system in quantum mechanics that can be used to think about our molecules and how they vibrate. So here you see these two red spheres connected by a spring. And this can be a simple model system for a diatomic molecule. You can think about the bond that holds together two atoms as being sort of like a spring. And those atoms can shake with respect to each other. They can move closer or farther away. Now, if we think about that, it takes energy to pull them apart and it actually takes energy to squeeze them very close together. And so what happens is they end up vibrating back and forth a little and we can model those vibrations using the Schrodinger equation. So I've written down the Schrodinger equation with our potential right here being the potential for our harmonic oscillator. Now we're not gonna actually solve the Schrodinger equation in this video. We're just gonna take advantage of the solutions to solve some problems. So the key thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna use the energy levels that the Schrodinger equation spits out for this harmonic oscillator, this vibrating set of atoms, to calculate the light absorbed or in some cases emitted by a molecular system. So we plug that stuff into our Schrodinger equation. What do we get out? Well, we get out a series of wave functions that tell us about how close or far apart our atoms are, and we get out a series of energies. So this equation right here describes all the different energies that our bonds can be vibrating at, or that our molecule can be vibrating at. And they're quantized, so that means they could be vibrating at 1 eV or 2 eV, but not somewhere in between. And we can see that graphically over here on the bottom right, and we see the ground state, what we call E0, and these are actually the probability distributions so it's the wave function squared, in other words. And that describes our ground state. And then if we give it more energy, we cause it to vibrate more, we go to E1. Notice that we're moving farther out. That means sometimes our, molecule, our atoms are farther apart from each other than they were in the ground state. And we've added energy to the system. We can take it up to E2. And then they start vibrating even faster, and they can get even farther apart from each other. Or to E3. So we can keep adjusting the energy levels of this system. We can make them vibrate more and more with respect to each other. And what we're going to think about is what's the relationship between how these molecules are vibrating and the light that they've absorbed. So let's take a closer look at our equation for the energy levels. This says E sub n. That means if I want to know an energy level, I plug in an n to this equation and it spits out the energy level for that specific energy. We want to know the ground state, plug in zero right there. You want to know the first excited state, plug in one and so forth. What are these other values here? Well, we have the force constant, which is K, and that's a measure of how strong or easy it is to pull those atoms apart. So some bonds, which are very strong, are harder to stretch and compress. Other bonds allow it to be stretched and compressed more easily. So this force constant takes into account how hard it is to stretch or compress our uh, molecular system. Down here, we have something that represents the mass. It's called the reduced mass. Basically, it takes into account the mass of both of our atoms. Now, it's a little more complicated if we take into account those masses separately, so the reduced mass allows us to combine those two masses into one. And here we have Planck's constant over 2 pi, so that's h-bar, which is just Planck's constant over 2 pi. Now, one thing to keep in mind whenever we're talking about uh, spectroscopy is that in general, and this is not always true, but most of the time true, the strongest absorption is going to be from the n equals 0 state to the n equals 1 state. And that's because our atoms most of the time, our molecules and atoms most of the time are in the ground state, that is the n equals zero state. And so if you just shine light on them, the most likely thing to happen is for them to be kicked up to the first excited state. So keep that in mind when you're doing spectroscopy problems. One other thing to keep in mind, if I wanna change the energy level of our system, I need to put in a photon, I need to put in light. And how much I increase the energy level of our system by is equal to the energy of a photon. And this is a really important equation for all of spectroscopy. The change in energy of our system is going to be equal to the energy of our photon. So if I want to take it from the ground state all the way up to the fifth excited state, well, then I need to put in more energy, that is a photon with more energy, than if I wanted to go from the ground state to the second excited state. So the change in energy of our system is equal to the energy of the photon, and we're going to use that to solve some problems. What do these problems look like? Well, here's one. It says a strong absorption of infrared radiation is observed for HCl, at 3,350 nanometers. That's in the infrared. Notice it also tells us the isotopes of hydrogen, it's the one with 
one thing in the nucleus and the isotope of chlorine that we're using. It's the one with 35 things in the nucleus. The reason it does that is because when we change the mass, we change the solutions to those energy levels. We change the solutions to our spring constant. And so we need to know exactly what atoms we're dealing with, not just chlorine, but which specific isotope. And the question asks, what is the force constant for this molecule? So what that's asking for is K. Remember that K in our equation down here is the force constant. Now, rather than breaking this problem up into specific steps, I've just given helpful tips there, and that's going to make these uh, steps more helpful if you're going to solve slightly different problems. These problems will vary a little bit whenever you see them, and these tips hopefully can help you even if the problem doesn't look exactly like this. So the first thing we're going to do, and this is very often a good first thing to do, is just to calculate the reduced mass. We need that in kilograms. Why? Because Planck's constant in our equation down here is uh, in joule seconds, which secretly has kilograms in it. So we're going to have to calculate those in kilograms. So let's calculate the reduced mass, and that's sort of like our step one in this case. So the first thing we're going to do is just calculate the reduced mass. The reduced mass is calculated by taking mass one times mass two over mass one plus mass two. So this is how you calculate the reduced mass, and the formula is down there at the bottom. First, I'm going to calculate it in AMUs, and then we're going to convert it to kilograms. You could do it in either direction. You could convert to kilograms first if you wanted. So for hydrogen, which we'll call our mass 1, it weighs 1.01 AMUs, or has a mass of 1.01 AMUs, and chlorine is 35.0. And then we divide that by 1.01 plus 35.0. Now, that's going to spit out 0.982. AMU to three sig figs. You want to keep that full number in your calculator for when you're doing the problems later to avoid round off error. All right, now we're just going to go ahead and take that to kilograms because we need it in kilograms. So 0 0.98 A982 AMU. And what we have to do is we have to multiply that by 1.6161 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms over 1 AMU. And that's going to spit out our mass, our reduced mass, in kilograms. Again, this is just taking into account the mass of both of our atoms in one term, and it makes our math a little simpler. So that's our mu. That's our reduced mass. And that's going to be useful later in the problem. All right, so that was the first helpful tip. And we're going to solve them like steps, but they're not just specific to this problem. So if you try to use those tips as you solve other problems, they may help too. All right, next we want to write an expression for delta E, and this is definitely a step that's helpful uh, in a number of spectroscopy problems. So what's delta E? Well, delta E is equal to our change in energy for this system. And since it tells us that we have a strong absorption, what that's telling us about is the n equals 1 to the n equals 2 state. So that's what we're dealing with here because it's a strong absorption, and that's going to be important for calculating our delta E. So for delta E, remember, if we look at our equation in the bottom right, it's h bar times the square root of k over mu, and then we plug in our n. Well, when we want to calculate del delta E, we need to do energy final minus energy initial, and that's going to give you a positive energy change. So if you ever flip them around and get a negative number out, check your energies. You need to do final minus initial. Eventually, our molecule is going to be in the excited state after it absorbs light. So we need to put in n equals 2 there. And then we need to subtract from that our initial state, h bar square root of k over mu. And now we plug in 1 for n. All right? So we can actually combine those. Those look identical except for one's 2 plus 1 half and one's 1 plus 1 half. So the difference between those is just 1, right? If we think about 2 plus 1 half minus 1 plus 1 half, that's 2.5 minus 1.5, or 1. And so what we're going to get out is h bar square root of k over mu. All right, so that's sort of our second helpful tip. And like I said, you're going to want to keep that in mind for a lot of spectroscopy problems. The next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to set equal the energy of our photon to the change in energy. Now, the energy of our photon can be calculated regardless of what information we're given about our light, right? If we're given frequency, we can calculate it. Wavelength, we can calculate it. If we're given wave number, we can calculate it. In this case, we're given wavelength. And so this is the most useful form 
of our energy of photon equation. So this is all equal to our energy of our photon. Why is that? Because of conservation of energy, right? We're putting in a photon to increase the energy of our system. So the energy of our system can't increase by any more than the energy we give it in the form of light. So that's going to be equal to hc over lambda. Now, because we have h and h bar in this equation, I'm going to go ahead now when I rewrite this, rewrite the left-hand side's h bar as h over 2 pi. Because the h's you'll see in a second are going to cancel, and so sometimes it's nice to have only h or h bar and not a mixture of the two. All right, so that was helpful hint number three. We wanted to set energy of our photon equal to the change in energy. Now, we want to go ahead and rearrange for the desired variable. That's part four. So rearrange for the desired variable. What are we solving for in this case? In this case, we want the force constant, which is k, so we're going to rearrange for k. That's this guy right here. We want to rearrange for that. All right, so the first thing to do is to multiply both sides by 2 pi over h. And that's going to give us square root of k over mu equals 2 pi hc over lambda h. Well now you can see our h's cancel and so that's why it was nice to get rid of that h bar. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to square both sides to get rid of that radical. So when we do that now we're going to get k over mu equals 2 pi, our h is gone now so it's just c, over lambda and that's all squared. All right Last step to solve for k. We need to multiply both sides by mu. So our equation that we're ultimately going to get for the spring constant for this exact problem is mu times 2 pi c over lambda squared. And now what we do is we just plug in our numbers. So that's the last tip, the last step for this problem. What was our mu? Well, remember we calculated that a moment ago to be 1.63 times 10 to the minus 27. And now we plug in 2 times pi times the speed of light, which is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And on the bottom, we're going to put wavelength. Now remember, whenever you plug wavelength into this equation, remember our speed of light's in meters, so we need to have our wavelength in meters. Our wavelength is 3,350 nanometers. So to convert that to meters, all we have to do is add this times 10 to the minus 9th factor. So that's times 10 to the minus 9th. Now, we can plug that all into our calculator. When we do, to three sig figs, we're going to get out that our spring constant is 460, 460 newtons per meter. And this should actually have a decimal there because that zero is significant. That's equal to our k. So. We did all of that work to figure out, basically, how hard is it to stretch that bond. It takes 460 newtons to stretch that bond a meter or to compress it a meter. Of course, if we actually try to stretch it out to a meter, it's going to rip it apart. But we can use that to calculate the force needed to push those atoms closer or farther apart. So this is how we can use the harmonic oscillator model to calculate things like the force constant. You could also calculate the masses that you're dealing with. You could calculate the energy of the light that would be absorbed when it transitioned energy if I gave you the force constant. So all sorts of different variations on this problem, but the main thing to keep in mind is that when we use the equations for the harmonic oscillator that come out of the Schrodinger equation, we can think about how light is going to interact with the vibrational states of our energy. Thanks for watching Real Chemistry. If you have any questions, please ask them below.